All right, then I think we're good to start. Hello, welcome everybody. Uh, my, my name is Paul Ritzke, um, and with me I have Harry van Rossum, my colleague from the Netherlands, and uh, maybe one of the reasons we're doing this session in English and, and, and not in German. Um, see a, a yeah, lot of faces, around six new faces, two colleagues and partners that we've met, and we're going to talk today about composable commerce, soothing the storms of commerce platforms. And that's just a little wordplay we did with uh, composable commerce. There's a lot of sessions here at Print Day on composable commerce, and we wanted to twist that around a bit and, and give a perspective, our perspective on this topic, and talk a bit about um, commerce projects, where they go wrong, what we can do better. Then, yeah, as I said, Harry with me from yeah. the Netherlands, country manager Benelux. Mm -hmm. You've worked at Sitecore, Bloomreach, ContentServe. Oh, all kinds of players. Where, where haven't you worked? Uh, Microsoft. <laughs> Not yet. No. Uh, no. <laughs> um, and, and your quote is, um, people should ask themselves, is this technology, that, the, that functionality really needed? Yeah. And uh, what the price for it? Can you, can you elaborate? Um, I've been in, in sales and in consultancy roles with customers over the last 20 years. And I tend to see a lot of, um, okay, choices made I doubt if they are made for the right decisions. Made, you know, yes, we can do this and that and that and that. And then if you ask them, okay, so what are you going to be doing with it? And what are you trying to achieve with it? You know, let's take an example of the word headless. Yeah. Uh, and now, of you know, composable, it's, it's a lot of vibe around it. And I think that a lot of companies are not really looking into an ROI or the business value that comes out of it. I'm not saying that it's not good. But I'm saying that we need to do our homework uh, for that in order to get the most out of it. Um, and I think that, yeah, what Paul said, um, we are the odd one out here because we're an e-commerce vendor and there's no commerce vendors here. There's some PIM vendors and everything else is around print. So you might ask, what, why here? But if I heard the keynote correctly this morning, it basically what um, the customer is trying to do with his catalog in personalizing it and building out, you know, big catalogs and small catalogs. That's what e-commerce has been doing over the last 20 years online. So there's a lot of, um, in my sense, a lot of interaction and a lot of uh, cohesion between the two channels. And it comes down to, in order to do that, to have a correct product data. And that's also what they said. So PIM is important. So um, what is it that we do? Um, and we want the road that we want to take you with you uh, in those, uh, you know, 45 minutes or 40 minutes is, okay, how do we deliver this to our customers? Because we are a commerce PIM online solution integrating with, with print. So I think that, you know, with that, that knowledge and that background, we want to share some things with you and see if we can give you ideas or, you know, if you say, ah, well, you know, what we have is okay. And, but... That's basically the goal for today. And like, you know, we are not in a big group. Um, so if you have questions in the middle, ask. Because I like the dialogue and to share experiences uh, back and forth. So. Yeah. Thanks for setting the stage yep. around our topic. Um, you said headless. You said, mm. um, do you really need that functionality? And that also relates a bit to, to my quote uh, that I brought. Is commerce platforms should not overwhelm. Uh, they should, uh, you know, empower, improve your business. And, and headless, that's what we hear in sales so much. People, customers coming to us, yeah. do you support headless? And it's been like that for the last three, four years. And we always ask, why? Why do you need headless? Oh, It's a neighbor who has it. comes from marketing. The neighbor Our marketing has it. wants it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, shortly about me, you've, uh, I've introduced you. I sit in Berlin. Uh, I'm country manager Dach. I was working, or first studying, then working, then dropped out of my master's, uh, started full-time at Dynamic Web. Uh, my mom might say it's a, it's a bad choice, my boss is happy. Um, then I moved to Berlin where we opened our office last September, so that's where I'm now sitting. Um, and Dynamic Web originally comes from Denmark, so that's uh, sitting two hours north of Flensburg in uh, the second largest city in Denmark, Aarhus, um, where many of our colleagues still sit. The agenda, you, you talked a bit about what we're going to talk about, but yeah, mainly the bullet points. Um, we're going to introduce you to the storms of commerce platforms, the projects, the common frustrations, setbacks, uh, why composable which experience stack is right, and, and for who is it right, and, and what experience stack is right. 
and a bit about the journey of Dynamic Web, just because we've transitioned so much in the last six, five, six years with the market, with the market trends going from uh, perpetual uh, and on-premise to cloud and subscription, and, and the same with this whole composable architecture, because we actually started out as a pure CMS, became a suite, so we're kind of on the opposite side, but within the last years we've, yeah, I would say, opened our doors, mm -hmm. um, followed trends. Yep. Then we have some success stories, some uh, successful Dynamic Web customers, and in the end, but as Harry said, just shout in between, stop us, ask us questions in between as well, otherwise we can have a small discussion in the end, if we don't run out of time. Yeah. Yeah, we were sitting, uh, uh, prepping for the today, and we're, we're discussing, okay, so how do we build up this, you know, what, what do we run into? Um, and I think that um, uh, digital transformation um, is hard. Um, I think also what I've seen is that most e-commerce projects go either over budget, take too long, and when it's delivered, it's actually not doing what they were supposed to do. But if you're 18 months down the road, and your thoughts have developed over 18 months, and the organization has developed over 18 months, and the markets of your customers have developed over 18 months, um, you might end up as a, shrip, a shipwreck. So um, I think that's also one of the things that are very important if you start commerce project, or PIM project for that matter, or um, um, personalization project is, okay, a, when you, you say yes now, it's going to take time before it's been delivered and you, when you go live. And in the meantime, the world has changed. So you need to try to forecast and look down the line, uh, look two years ahead, will it then generate? Is it aligned with the organization? Um, if I choose a best of breed solution, uh, I get a lot of different vendors on board. I get a lot of different players to help me realize my dream on board that could also bring in a political situation that uh, when it is failing or it's not bringing what you want it, we're starting to point fingers. Mm. It's, it's reality. It's, uh, and we see that in simple projects as well. So yeah. we work a lot with Dynamics ERP partners, Dynamics ERPs, and, and even there we see it, you know, who's to blame, what goes wrong when it's on the integration. So when, when shit hits the fan, that's really when that political complexity uh, comes more. Yeah, yeah, definitely. More important. That's, uh, but that's all, you know, organizational-wise. Uh, mm. On the technical part, um, the more different tools that you bring on board um, might bring a lot of integration challenges with it because they need to connect to, uh, together. Uh, you need to be able, as a company, you need organization, you need to rely on the business data that comes out of it. Um, and as, as, as the company changes, integrations change, and can you still rely on that? So that's a topic that is definitely should be high on the agenda. Um, and that also basically uses um, a discussion point, should we go for all different kinds of vendors, or should we go look more into a business suite all-in-one solution? Because that is where you know an entire stack is built up from the ground in one architecture, in one structure, um, and you have less integrations. Mm. And it has its pros and cons. Uh, when you go for a best of breed PIM, a best of breed commerce, best of breed CMS, but in the end, it's exactly that many projects you have to manage, that many uh, combined risks, partners to blame, who's supporting this illusion when it's live. Um, yeah. and, and the pros and cons, I think, we'll go in a bit later when mm -hmm. we talk about yeah. which experience stack is right. You brought some examples. And yeah, this is it's, um, again, you know, how do you make it, you know, you get those, uh, uh, when you're in, um, in conferences and you f uh, see a keynote, sometimes you get those questions, okay, if look left and look right, and um, the company sitting on the left is not in business anymore after a couple of years. So I was looking, okay, so who missed the boat over the last couple of years? Um, and our logos that we know, um, and Office Center is one of them. Um, they got acquired by Dutch investors out of Staples US because they were pushing it all out uh, a couple of years ago. Um, they started with 32 stores. Uh, it was pre-corona. Um, and that company basically missed the boat on their digital transformation. Uh, they had a couple of solutions, big expensive enterprise solutions within the organization. Um, 
the fact is that those projects basically never became successful. And instead of the, the board being able to focus on you know, the digital transformation, they chose to expand uh, and acquire the 51 stores of Staples in, in Germany. Um, and um, yeah, this is basically how sexy and customer experience a, a store like Offer Center looked and nobody wanted to go there. And um, yeah, basically during the corona, they fell through. It's, it got rebooted again, of course, but, uh, but it is, uh, they went uh, belly up in that period. Not the only one. You also brought Toys R Us. Yeah, or Toys R Us is another one. But, you know, Dynamic Web is most likely or mostly focusing on B2B customers. So it's, it's always hard to find the solutions that are actually B2B that, that resonate with our story. Um, but Toys R Us is, uh, is, an, is also a nice example out of the US. Uh, also, it, it's still in existence. Um, but, um, yeah, they just failed to see that the market around them were changing. The toy market went from one go one week to the other week uh, fully online and Toys R Us missed it um, and you know you also have in the US uh, examples of Best Buy with videos uh, you know that world changed and they failed uh, to, to adopt to that point mm. so that's uh, yeah. yeah and I also brought another one um, I think there's many examples uh, and, and this is more to highlight really the, the importance or, or the benefits also of a composable architecture not falling behind market trends as with these examples um, yesterday there was a session of Retresco, or in general I think with, with the hype around ChatGPT, that being a perfect example with, with the PIM system. And if you have a, a architecture that gives you a flexible solution where you can integrate technology that comes up, creating product, product descriptions with ChatGPT content, um, I think that that's just an example mm -hmm. of why you need to have a, a solution, so stay flexible. Gary Weber was one of them, they're still, still around, just like Office Center, survives it, but very late with digitalization, and there's many examples. Galeria, uh, Quelle, I think, yeah. Household names that have basically uh, yeah. left. So, why, why composable then? Yeah, that's the big question. <laughs> why composable? Um, there's a lot of, um, we want, organizations want flexibility. That's understandable. You want to be able to take out parts and put in other parts of the solution, being it if you want to do things on social media or an omni-channel, you know, you need to be able to follow your market or stay close to the market. So I guess Composable is definitely important. Um, I think you should also look from a fact that, okay, am I as an organization ready for Composable? Um, do I have- yes, what Composable is? Just yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's uh, yeah. Maybe uh, if I uh, take this apart, yeah. that's composable. All the different parts are composable. That's yeah. yeah that's I think that is what, how we're looking at it right now. Or how the market is looking at it. Um, can I sit on the chair without the legs underneath it? No. But um, yeah. Different components. Different components, um, and then the question is that. Um, that's where we start off with. If um, if you ask a customer um, and they say, "Yeah, we want composable," what do you want to get out of it? Basically, the same question that you're asking. And then a lot of people are saying, "Well, because the market is yelling composable." Yeah, um, but have you thought about you know the what do you get out of it? That's and I think that nine out of ten times that question remains unanswered. Yeah. yeah, and we do have another slide, of course. So as I mentioned, yeah. flexibility, not falling behind market trends, typically easily to modify, uh, add or remove components. You know, if you choose Dynamic Web, for instance, do you need a PIM? Do you choose another PIM? Uh, what CMS do you use? Um, in, in a way, vendor independence of, of choosing different experience stacks, different components, tools, um, not, not being completely reliant on, on one partner. Um, simplification, although that's questionable, uh, I guess, but uh, yeah. at least when it comes to integration services, um, the, um, yeah, it, it can simplify your landscape. Also, when you look forward to yeah, six, that's what, seven but that's years. also what the promises are, eh? mm -hmm. because um, yeah, because it, you know you say simplification, but if I have different parts, um, you know, I think that the example that I always used is uh, if I would 
take two, well, let's take two German people, take one out of Hamburg and one out of Bayern and put them in one room. I think there's a lot of, yes, they can talk to each other, but there's a lot of su sweet uh, things in it that doesn't help in the communication. So for me, that is definitely not simplifying mm. a situation like that. Yeah. But I think with the example of the chair, let's say um, you started with that chair when you were little, when your business was smaller, you only needed small legs mm -hmm. and, and your business grows, yeah. you grow, you need a bigger chair. Can you then, do you need to buy a new chair? Well, in a, in a non-composable architecture, mm -hmm. you probably would. Or you just take that part apart, get longer legs for that chair, and by that, yeah, yeah stay flexible. Scalability, I think that is um, one of the biggest arguments as well. Um, being able to expand, you know, what if you want to move into print? What if you want to combine that omni-channel experience with print? Um, getting catalogs, catalog production um, in it as well. Yeah. Then, yeah, I think the example I gave with ChatGPT, um, the importance of print and omni-channel communication is the, in the keynote we've seen this morning. Um, just being able to, to adapt to a rapidly changing environment, not falling behind, um, staying up to date with market trends. So, which experiences? Yeah. Here <laughs> comes the answers. <laughs> uh, that, that's a one answer only. No, I mean, <laughs> that depends on the organization. Yeah, I, I always tend to come back to that. You know, do you have an organization? What's your future? Do you have a, a sense of where do you want to go and then adopt to what you need? And that could either be, because I have customers that do, in the Netherlands, 150, 200 million in revenue on a yearly basis, B2B customer. Um, small, smaller, they're not as sexy as Heineken, because we all want to work there, but they have the same commerce, online ex uh, challenges as a, a carpet uh, producer. But a carpet producer as an organization, they're located in the Netherlands in Genemuide, of all places. And that's, a, that's an environment that has all kinds of carpet uh, uh, manufacturers. It's not sexy enough for a lot of marketeers. But business-wise, they do 200 million a year. So it's an interesting customer, uh, but those customers are not big enough for composable, best-of-breed solutions. They are much, much more helped with a sweet solution. Mm. So it, it is... You know, go to Heineken, yes, Composable is, you know, the way to go. Uh, but if you um, look at a different vendor, different B2B organization, a suite does fit much better. So it's, uh, things like that come into play. Exactly. And customization, personalization uh, with a suite, uh, you are in a way more limited. You start with a much higher um, starting point with the tools that suite gives you. But it also can reach a limit um, when you need to exchange things, um, want to scale, want to add components, um, which in a composable architecture um, will, will be much easier to, to do. Technology partnership, we talked about it um, earlier. You, you, you said you don't like the word vendor lock-in, but in a way uh, you, uh, have, uh, you rely on a partner with a suite, but you also have one it, it that is you can a, blame that uh, it's it supports a, It's you. a standard uh, uh, response out of a customer. I don't want vendor lock-in, so I mm. want composable. My response is, okay, so you have Microsoft, yeah, you have Office, you have uh, Business Central as ERP, so you, you are Microsoft house, yeah. What is that not vendor lock-in? It's, it's, it's choosing a technology stack. And make sure that you have partners that support that technology stack and that solution, and that way you can always generate a different relationship with a different partner uh, in the end, the technology is the basis and the partner makes the solution to fit your organization. Mm -hmm. so, so no, for me it's not a vendor locking. Technology. It's a technology. Or, or, or reliability yeah. on, on, on one partner. Yeah. Total cost of ownership, time to market. Um, well, with a suite you might implement, need to use much of that, the features, the tools that gives you. It can be a long, long project, but um, so can a composable. Um, same with the total cost of ownership. Yeah. If you pay one license, one product, um, have all the tools you need. And, and, and what could be the payoff when, when you go composable? 
Uh, well, if you look at Dynamic Web, we we st we de we developed in, uh, we started in '99 and we went a, a route and we of course also embraced Composable. So our our stack consists of different parts that you can either use all together as a suite, or you could um, take out certain parts and put in other parts. So mm -hmm. yes, we fulfill the Mach Alliance. Uh, goals. Mm. Uh, so we, we are able to fit in the bigger customers that want to you know, dream on that composable stuff um, and we fit on the customers that say look I have a small IT company or a small IT department, less marketing people and I'm much more suited for a suite solution because all the functionalities are in there to help. Mm. But how, we'll get that. Yeah. How, um, and how was it with the Dynamic Web let's say six, seven years ago or with any other suite all-in-one solution platform? If five, six years you outgrow, maybe just certain components. Yeah. That brings you into a, a new project, having to, to start from scratch, right? Yeah. I think that is where Composable or having a Composable platform um, can give higher flexibility. Integration, extensibility. Um, yeah, in a Composable architecture, you rely on pre-built APIs, microservices, um, while with a suite, um, it might give you some limitations, or at least you have to rely on, on certain standards. Um, OData, as an example, um, where you can get really far with it. We started talking about the story of Dynamic Web, yeah. just to give a bit of insights where we're from. Uh, we mentioned that in Denmark we have offices in, in the US, uh, Australia, Singapore, since last year in Berlin. How long have you been in Benelux? Uh, we have been operating in the Benelux, uh, I think, for about 15 years now. Hmm. Yeah, I think in general Scandinavia, um, in North America, those are our, when you look at also at our customers that we have a slide with later. Um, still really heavily influenced by yeah, that. Yes, so, so if you look at the organization, the main markets that we're focusing on are uh, the Nordics, uh, the Benelux, the US, and we have uh, enlarged that with uh, the Dach region, that's why we have opened an office in Berlin. Um, we are putting foot on the ground in the UK now, so we are expanding, but on a controllable manner, And but we have mm. customers in South America, South in Africa. Uh, South Africa, and we have no partners there, so uh, it's not that... Uh, mm. But all the white dots are basically where we have uh, our own people on the ground. Exactly. And we started in 1999 as a actually pure CMS um, at a time, or at least in the first years, with Sidecore. That's where um, you know many CMS come from. Completely .NET based. We now move to .NET Core. Core. Um, started as CMS. Um, shortly later added marketing, e-commerce, um, so that we really made a transition, right, with, with the first, basically, catalog. Um, customers asking us, oh, we want this catalog that we have to be present on our website that brought us into e-commerce. Um, historically, uh, coming from Denmark for the last 15, 17 years, we've been very close to Microsoft, uh, very focused on, on Dynamics ERP solutions as well. Um, so we added that part, the integration, standard components for, for all Dynamics uh, ERPs. Um, we added the PIM around six years ago. Um, that was also a bit before we moved into the cloud and subscription business and went away from on-premise perpetual licenses. And in yeah, four years ago, you would implement Dynamic Web either by core, building it up from scratch, use our, our pre-built components, um, Swift, what we call it, so you can create websites with a visual editor, create a B2B shop, a B2C shop, brand shop, digital asset portal without knowing how to code. Um, but yeah, as, as we said, we, we moved a bit with the market, opened yeah. our eyes, customers um, that have demands. And we're now also able to implement Dynamic Web Headless, where we have an example to show you later of a fashion retailer in, in Iceland. And we now have a management API, which means anything you can do in the backend, you can also trigger from, from another system yeah. with the API. Um, and this looks a bit like pizza boxes, components. Uh, you, you said before you can just take yeah, Whatever you, you like apart, we have customers that only use our PIM, we have many customers that start with our PIM, then yeah, look at the e-commerce e because in the end it's just building a front end, it's, it's still one platform, but yeah. we're not dependent. Yeah. Is it possible to add external solutions, to, um, for example I use my own CMS instead of your CMS system? Yeah, that's possible, we can publish products from PIM in, in, in the CMS, um, or even completely yeah, headless. Um, from a sales perspective, we always try our customers to, sure. but but that's from a sales perspective. <laughs> yeah. But that's the reality, <laughs> nine out of ten times look different. So mm -hmm. there's a and it's a journey. Of course, who who nowadays or many of our customers already sell online. So sometimes we start with a PIM, integrate a, a shopware shop, 
a uh, Magento solution, and then maybe we launch a B2B store uh, a year later because it is, in the end, building a front end for the data we already have in PIM. But yeah, we, we're not um, limited to these um, the channels that we can serve with the PIM. Yeah, and that's basically where the integration comes into play because we integrate with print uh, to be able to do catalogs. We integrate with uh, marketplaces, marketplaces uh, through uh, vendors like Channable or you know things like that to be able to uh, to support an omni-channel uh, uh, also B two B environment. Enough, well, yeah. enough about yeah, the history so. of Dynamic Web, but. Uh, I think these are some examples that uh, how, how you can use Dynamic Web. Yeah. Well, six years ago, five years ago, four years ago, that would be Dynamic Web. Uh, oftentimes, it would be more complex for us to actually integrate with a separate PIM, with a separate CMS. Um, so what, what do we mean with a composable suite? Uh, is that a bit of contradiction? Yeah, this is marketing. <laughs> this is, yeah, it, it is um, um, the, the pizza boxes are uh, a set of functionalities around a main topic. So commerce, PIM, um, and you can basically swap them out. So I, I guess that uh, the examples that we have could give a better answer to this um, than just a high over slide. Yeah, success, success stories. That's sales again. <laughs> so a Tricorp, uh, to, to, to start with, that's a company in, in the Netherlands. Um, they are doing, that's, Primarily B two B, they have a um, yeah composable architecture because they are not using our PIM. <coughs> they were using Perfion already before we came in uh, in, in the game. Um, so we deliver the entire front end on commerce online marketing CMS. Um, they have a unique Conta uh, ERP solution uh, in the back end. Um, they have about six or seven different languages to support all their countries. Um, yeah, they, what they do is, you know, me as a worker can log in uh, and, and get a customized uh, B2B portal and order my workwear um, that is branded according to my company that I'm a member of, uh, of an employee of. Yeah, another one is, um, this is a, a project that is uh, just started. Um, and this is a different customer. They want to. Uh, they needed to have a PIM. Um, they were thinking about a composable architecture uh, with a different PIM solution, but in the end, they said, "Well, you know, our organization is not big enough to embrace a composable architecture. We want to have a suite that gives us flexibility now, um, but also we only need to have one knowledge set in the house." So uh, we are starting, our, our partner is now starting to uh, implement PIM uh, connected to data pools. Uh, and in this PIM solution, we are actually doing a part of master data management in the sense that the data pools don't, you know, they push continuously new product data and they want to adapt or change that product data without having it overwritten again when there's a new set of uh, coming out of the data pool uh, that they're using. And then they're going to do commerce. Mm -hmm. And this is an example from one of our partners from Iceland, with a customer from Iceland, S4S. It's a big fashion retailer, actually. If you look in the top, uh, it says uh, shoes and, and air and gym stuff, and they have all kinds of different brands. So they needed to have a very flexible front end um, that customers can click through. The different stores still have one basket to check out with. Um, and here we actually did not deliver um, the CMS. Um, well, not the front end. Exactly, not the front end part of the CMS. So it's it's, it's we delivered the business central connector integrated to the ERP, the e-commerce part, but only the back end, the CMS part, the back end, and they actually have a, um, yeah, a completely separated fr uh, front end that their developers can work with um, because they have that in-house. And through the API and through OData um, from the ERP, but with the API from our CMS and our back end, we, we just push whatever products, commerce functionality, um, add to cart content um, through all the different stores. So they use it in web backend, but completely different front end. So that's basically a composable architecture. That yeah. is yeah. headless. So that's how flexible the solution exactly. can be. And these are just some, some logos, some brands that we serve. As we said, very Scandinavian, North American, um, some big customers in Germany with Belize Haas. They also went for the whole suite. Um, yeah. Yeah. Then 
I think we can go to the last slide. Questions? Anyone who has thoughts, doubts, challenges? Want to challenge us or Harry? Harry likes to be challenged. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you, then I'll let me put a question in front. Um, do you ever run into these situations in your uh, uh, area? Coming out of print PIM towards this or? <laughs> Some headaches I hear. <laughs> Not an um, e-commerce situation, but a situation where um, our PIM provider needed uh, we needed um, um, a program to compare our old version of our data sheet to our new version of data sheet, and our PIM provider tried to think of something and maybe program a mm -hmm. solution, but um, it was um, very uh, um, it would cost too much and didn't look like we wanted. And then we found a um, pretty easy um, program uh, with, I don't know, $150 a year mm. license. Really not that much. That's uh... Nothing. <laughs> and uh, they basically uh, it's put old version in one um, folder, uh, new version in another, click compare, and it's done. And you have a double-sided uh, PDF with all the um, okay. uh, differences. And it was so easy that we choose to do that. But we still like our PIM system. And we like to um, uh, use all the models that they can offer. Mm -hmm. But we like to uh, expand on other things uh, to just to complete the whole picture. OK. So and what kind of PIM system are you using? Oh, okay. But that's a German, mm -hmm. pure German solution. But if you want to talk in German, that's fine. He is German. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, yeah. But are you agreeing with? It depends on the situation whether you can choose for, for a suite or uh, separate uh, components. Yeah. yeah. There, there is no one, one solution which is the best. No. Do you look at something like print suite as a composable component? Is that a dumb question? Um, <laughs> no, I don't think so. No, I, I think it is. Um, uh, out of our PIM, how we look at it from an architectural point is that we have um, prim, PIM is the single source of truth, yep. like we all say. Uh, and out of that, we, have, uh, we generate channels yep. that are um, XML based, uh, based on the data that you want to get out. Um, and that could be for a web shop different data than for a print or for a different solution. And we look for, we, you know, we integrate with print to enable customers to use Easy Catalog yep. to, or Adobe InDesign, I mean, uh, to make catalogs uh, because they want up to date, real time product data in that, that InDesign file. Um, then we could, uh, and, and f for our business, we have strategically chosen to look for vendors to have a technology partnership with, instead of building the solution ourselves. That's a... Did you just say you can link my PIM to Easy Catalog so I can produce? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so in, in different solutions, we have different vendors. So we have, you know, if you look at print, we do we work, things with print work. and with Easy Catalog to populate uh, Adobe InDesign uh, okay. we catalogs. Okay, we are working with Easy Catalog, but we have a little bit of a problem getting the data from a PIM into... Really? Yeah, uh, really. You're not using ours. Uh, no, sorry, but uh, no, but that, that is... Uh, print. <laughs> No, but that, that is what you know. That that's how. We, so we 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 are not married to the hip to print. You know, we want to be able to show our customers there are different ways of going about it to to integrate with. So that's uh, and print knows that we that we also do things with each catalog. So yeah, it doesn't just have to be product data, right? With dynamic web as an example, it could be 
commerce data and abandoned it, it, shopping carts. Yeah, I think getting, that the, the, sto flyer. the, the story of uh, the customer this morning, I saw that I'm like, wait, you know, this is what we do online. You know, we have all the customer data uh, inside. You know, you come to the website, we know what you've been looking at. We know which products have been pushed in a, in a shopping cart. And if the shopping cart is not uh, actually uh, placed into an order, you could a, send out a personal email, but you could also make a, a personal flyer, a card, and use print to do that. That's because we have all the data in it, so. Just yeah. out of curiosity, because I worked previously with Celtech, which is also yeah. a Mock Alliance uh, partner. Yeah. Um, and one of the questions that customers will often have and they seem confused about is the availability of data, right? So they think like, oh, if I have a Mock certified PIM and I make a change in, let's say, a Kineo, it's immediately available on the website. But a Kineo is not feeding data to the website, right? It's feeding to the CMS, which then renders to the website, right? Uh -huh. So I think there's confusion from the customer perspective of like, what is the actual flow of data? Right? Yeah. Um, so do you guys have any tools that you use? It's just a curiosity of mine to like show a customer, like here's the actual flow of information to the touch points, because people seem to be confused when you talk to them about like composables and stuff about what actually is connected and how. So I don't know if you have like a tool, like a visualization tool or something that you can use to show the customer. Because um, I think there's a lot of confusion on the customer side right. about like what parts do I need and how do they actually interact. Yeah. No, I don't. I don't have a visualization, visual uh, tool to show. Okay, well, if you push this, I, what we always do is we show, we can show in a demo. Uh, so okay, you have product data, you've saved the product data, and. Um, the product data is automatically published to the channels that that product is looked at or, or, or bound to. So if that's a shop, then instantly it's available on the front end. Uh, if it's a, 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 a Adobe InDesign file, then if you open up the Adobe InDesign file and you trigger Adobe OK Update, you get the data instantly in your uh, catalog. So that's, but I don't have a, a user interface uh, to show, okay, well, you know. But that's an architectural question. We've got right. over several solutions. Yeah. So mostly that's not within the, within the pin itself. Right. You know, to, to, to show. Yeah, I'm just saying, like, it's like whenever I've discussed this with customers, that it's almost like asking them to believe in God or something because they can't actually see yeah. the information flowing. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's kind of like, trust hey. us, it's going to work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, trust in microservices. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I don't know. I'm just curious if there's any. No, don't know. Of. It'd be nice to be able to have you know, yeah. a quick visual. Like here's yeah. here's the results. How did this all get assembled? You know? Nothing you put together and then yeah. show them there. Uh, there are some tools, but then that's an overload again. To, to yep. Yeah. Any other questions, remarks? Otherwise, perfect timing. Yes, one minute. One minute? Yeah. Oh, cool. I think, but. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for being here.